After months and months of waiting, we finally have some updates about Asteroid Bano and the samples that NASA retrieved a few months ago. With some of the new discoveries that we're going to be discussing today actually being somewhat surprising. But first, let's go through a bit of an overview about the asteroid and talk about some of the more important parts of the mission that a lot of you might have forgotten. So first of all, as you might have heard before, Bano is actually currently one of the most potentially hazardous asteroids simply because it has the highest chance of colliding with Earth in the next few hundreds of years. Here the chance is approximately 1 in 3000 by the year 2182. So not a very high chance, but still a chance. And this is actually one of the main reasons why this asteroid was chosen. It is a near-Earth asteroid, and it's an asteroid that, like so many others, potentially delivered a lot of important stuff to planet Earth, and thus could serve as a way for us to explain the origins of life. For example, we know that the samples from Ryugu, an extremely similar looking asteroid that we've discussed previously, in the video right there, contain a lot of important stuff, including uracil, one of the nucleobases for RNA, and a huge amount of organic molecules that we know life needs. And so NASA wanted to collect samples in order to find out what this asteroid is made out of. Sorry, not this asteroid, this asteroid. They actually do look very, very similar. And potentially answer a lot of other questions, with many of these questions maybe not even asked yet. And so they launched this mission back in 2016, and the samples finally came back to planet Earth in September of 2023. But as you might have heard from some of the other sources, the canister turned out to be extremely difficult to open. Two of the screws on the lid would not budge, and so it took NASA several months to finally open it, which they finally did in January of 2024. And so it's actually been just over a month from when I'm making this video, since the capsule was officially opened, and the highly protected samples inside have finally been removed and distributed amongst different teams. In case you're wondering, here's actually the list of various universities and various teams that are going to be receiving samples in the next few months. There are 38 in total, and they're all getting different amounts. Some of them are getting milligrams, some of them are getting a few grams. But in total, the sample inside was approximately 250 grams. Although most of this, like 70% of this, is going to be stored for posterity, just like NASA did with a lot of other samples, including Apollo mission samples, that are still in storage today. And the reason NASA does this is actually because, well, sometimes we just don't have the technology yet to try to analyze these samples in more detail. And so they basically keep them in storage for when we invent something new, they can then extract additional information from the samples that have already been studied. But basically, in the next few months, actually more like a couple of years from now, a lot of these teams are going to be studying these samples and investigating them in detail, with studies coming out in 2024 and 2025. And the questions they are trying to answer are obviously in regards to the origins of life, but also some other questions such as, okay, how do these samples compare to what we physically saw on Bano or around Bano prior to the mission collection? Is the inside part different from the outside? Also, what can it tell us about the evolution of the solar system? We know that Ryugu and various comets have already taught us quite a lot, but in this case the sample is huge, and so it should tell us a lot more. Also, has the sample changed at all since the spacecraft collected it, or has it been preserved really well? And intriguingly, right after the mission picked up the first samples, the researchers realized that outside of the capsule there was also a lot of extra dust as well. As a matter of fact, 70.3 grams or 2.5 ounces. So basically, not only do we have 250 grams inside, there was also 70 grams outside, although potentially slightly contaminated. But not contaminated enough to be thrown away. It was used for a lot of studies recently, and that's actually where some of the first results are coming from. And so, while a lot of engineers were struggling to open this, the material from the outside was already used by several teams to make first announcements and first discoveries. Here's actually one of the very interesting tools that was used to try to open this a few weeks ago. And so anyway, we have our first results. First of all, there's a lot of carbon. Approximately 5% of everything by weight was carbon. But in different types of form, organic and non-organic. And there was also water but in this case trapped in various crystals. And some of the first analysis using X-ray diffraction, a technique that usually reveals minerals in a sample, uncovered something really exciting. A lot of these minerals, or a lot of these materials, potentially resemble clay, specifically minerals known as serpentinites. Here's kind of what this looks like from planet Earth. 
And on our planet, these particular minerals actually require liquid water to form. Specifically, they require water that's usually poor in carbon dioxide, invading various rocks, forming a lot of serpentine shapes inside. Most of the rocks like this on Earth usually form on a seabed when the mantle from underneath is pushed upwards and ends up being exposed to water, which actually causes a lot of these rocks to form suddenly and also produces a lot of additional heat. And so it turns out that some of this stuff is very, very similar. On top of this, a lot of these darker rocks are covered in a slightly brighter material, and this turned out to be calcium and magnesium-rich phosphate minerals, but minerals that are usually extremely rare, and minerals that were actually only seen in some cases in the solar system, and the most famous one, the one you see right here, is from Saturn's moon Enceladus. The moon that has these beautiful geysers that shoot out from the surface of Enceladus and are extremely likely produced as a result of an ocean underneath. And a lot of these individual clues suggest to the scientists behind these studies or the studies that are going to be coming out really soon, this is most likely something that was formed in very similar conditions. Or to rephrase this, wherever Bano came from was possibly some kind of an ancient ocean world in the early solar system possibly extremely similar to Enceladus, that contained an ocean underneath with actually somewhat warm water, because a lot of these minerals only form when the water is somewhat hot. And so it's the formation of these minerals through the action of hot water that gives us the biggest clue. But because Bano is now Bano, just an asteroid, here the new proposition is that this is basically a leftover from an ancient collision between smaller planetesimals. Smaller objects, possibly even smaller than Enceladus, very likely just a few hundred kilometers across, that collided, destroying each other in the process, leaving nothing but debris and asteroids behind. But possibly thousands and even millions of these asteroids still somewhere in the solar system. And so at the moment, the samples from here provide us with a lot of evidence for a lot of this stuff being created in relatively hot liquid water environments, which is super surprising and actually really exciting. On top of this, some of the samples also contained unusual nanoglobules, which resemble tiny bubbles and whose origin is not entirely clear. Now on Earth, sometimes these are produced by life or can actually even serve as a potential source of origin of life, but in this case, it's still unknown. It will probably take months and months of looking at this to try to figure out where they came from. But intriguingly, all of this was discovered in just 200 milligrams from the sample on the outside of the capsule. There were something like 1000 different particles in there, and so this is just a tiny tiny part of the entire sample that we're definitely going to be hearing so much about in the next few years. But really, the discovery of this being potentially water-based is super exciting. And this actually comes on top of this other research from the SOFIA telescope that has recently looked at two separate really large asteroids in the asteroid belt, this one right here known as 7 Iris, and this one known as 20 Massalia, both approximately 200 kilometers across, revealing that both of them seem to contain signatures of water somewhere on their surface. Not a lot of water, something like 350 milliliters per cubic meter, but still definitely there. Which basically means that quite a lot of these objects potentially have very similar origins, maybe even starting in much larger objects that did contain a lot of water inside and were even very similar to Enceladus. But when it comes to Bennu, we're probably not going to know more or have more details for at least a few months. The analysis here is going to take a while, and so this is just some of the first preliminary discoveries. But when it comes to the rest of the mission, the spacecraft is now going to its next target, Apophis. And so in a few years from now, we're going to hear more about this mission as it starts to analyze its next asteroid and tries to interact with the surface of this asteroid, figuring out what's going on there as well. And Apophis used to be the number one most dangerous asteroid approximately a decade ago. Turns out that we actually miscalculated there and it's not as dangerous as NASA believed, making Bennu the new number one. And so anyway, once we have more details or more discoveries, we'll come back and talk more about this in some of the future videos. Until then, check out previous videos in the description, check out that video about Ryugu as well. Thank you for watching, subscribe, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, come back tomorrow to learn something else, support this channel on Patreon by joining channel membership or by buying a wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.